Hello, H Civil War subscribers, and welcome back to another episode of the Civil War Era in Digital Humanities. I'm your host, Chase McCarter, PhD student in history at the University of Mexico and resource editor for H Civil War. In this episode, I spoke with Dr. Charles R. Welsko from the Kentucky Historical Society about the Society's digital project, Civil War Governors of Kentucky. Dr. Welsko received his PhD under the direction of Jason Phillips at West Virginia University and is a cultural and social historian of the contested borderlands of mid 19th century America. Presently, he is working on turning his dissertation entitled Breaking and Remaking the Mason Dixon Line Loyalty in the Civil War Mid Atlantic, 1850 to 1900, into a monograph. And Dr. Welsko is also currently working on several publications about violence and African American history in Kentucky. Dr. Welsko is also an accomplished public historian, having interned at the Fredericksburg Spotsylvania National Military Park, the Ford Theater Society in Washington, D.C., and is a visiting professor of public history at the University of West Georgia. Dr. Welsko is currently the project director for the Kentucky Historical Society's digital project, Civil War Governors of Kentucky Documentary Digital Edition which is an online archive of 10,000 plus documents on the Civil War era that uses the offices of the five governors, three union and two provisional Confederate governors of Kentucky as a lens to examine the lives of ordinary people between Lincoln's election and the end of slavery in the Commonwealth. It also offers valuable insight into how Kentuckians, free or enslaved, unionist or Confederate, navigated the crisis of the Civil War era. I hope you enjoy our conversation. All right, Chuck, thank you so much for uh, taking some time today to talk to H Civil War about the Kentucky Historical Society's digital project, uh, Civil War Governors of Kentucky. Oh, thanks, Chase. It's really great to be here. It's a great opportunity to share about what we call CWGK, this massive project that uh, covers tens of thousands of documents about Civil War Kentucky and gives us an opportunity to see the lives of ordinary Kentuckians. And I'm really excited to talk about it. I thought we'd get started just by talking a little bit about uh, the origins of the project. You know, how did this digital project get started? And then I'm also really interested to hear, you know, how you got involved with this project. Yeah. Um, so the beauty of, C I guess, of this question, right, is there's two, I think, fascinating stories. One that wraps up with me, but one that is more broadly historiographical, one that's more broadly kind of the changing times of, of the past decade. Uh, CWGK is actually entering its uh, second decade of, of work. It began roughly about late 2009, 2010, so well before I was here at the Kentucky Historical Society, but it was a project that was started for the sesquicentennial of the Civil War. Uh, this project that really came out as uh, the nation was looking to embrace and kind of see how it should remember the Civil War especially for a border state like Kentucky, which has had a, an interesting memory or a contested memory of the Civil War. If we look at the works that come out in the 2010s, right, uh, Ann Marshall's work, uh, Creating a Confederate Kentucky, Patrick Lewis's look at Benjamin Buckner, Christopher Phillips's book on the Ohio River Valley, right, the idea of Kentucky identity and the memory of the Civil War in Kentucky has become kind of, um, Aaron Astor's work, right, uh, the issue of con Confederate memory in Kentucky uh, has become a focal point. And, and CWGK was established uh, in that period around 2010 as an attempt to push back against this uh, Confederate memory that has dominated Kentucky, right? This idea that Kentucky for too long, the story of Kentucky was too white and too Confederate around the Civil War. So the project focuses on Lincoln's election. So December of 1860 uh, through well, sorry, November of 1860 uh, through December of 1865, the official end of slavery, the last slaveholding state uh, in the Union when slavery is removed. So the, the beauty of the project, right, is we can use the five governors, the five men, uh, three Unionists, Beriah McGoffin, James Fisher Robinson, Thomas Bramlett, uh, three Union governors and two provisional Confederate governors, George Johnson and Richard Hawes, and we focus less on the men themselves, right? We, you'll find biographies of these individuals on our website. You find uh, information about them because they show up in these documents. But really we're using these individuals in their office and the documents that are being written to them or written from their office to understand how society, especially in a divided border state like Kentucky, experiences the throes of the Civil War, the, the chaos of guerrilla warfare, the, the process of the unequal process of emancipation 
How, how do all of these things play out on the ground and how do these individuals look both to local or state power? How can we develop social networks? How can we see how people are interacting with one another? Um, and I say we, right? I'm using that kind of imperial we. I, I adopted this project last year, but this was the intention, right, that CWGK started with. How can we recapture the voices of ordinary people, especially people, unionists, African Americans, uh, who are, or who have for, for a long period of time been neglected in the, in the literature of Kentucky, whether it was slavery was benevolent or the state was predominantly Confederate. How, how can we recapture normal voices? Uh, my predecessor, Patrick Lewis, right, would talk about the, the power of the mundane or uh, the idea that we're doing radical social history by looking at ordinary people and, and how they may appear just for a brief moment writing to a governor but how we can use those documents to suss out more of their lives and, and their experiences. Um, and it's through Patrick uh, that I actually was able to get an opportunity, uh, a plug for the SCWH's uh, mentorship program. Back, uh, so summer of 2018, I had applied for that mentorship program um, in advance of the conference in Pittsburgh. I got paired with Patrick Lewis. Ironically, I had reviewed his book when it came out for while I was in grad school for West Virginia history uh, and met up with Patrick at the conference, we started talking and right. I was kind of like, Oh, this sounds like a really awesome project. He unloaded a bunch of like papers and things he gave to me. And he was like, here's, here's what CWGK is. And he showed me the project. And I was like, this is really awesome. Fast forward a couple months. I run into him again at the Southern. I see a job uh, posting for a position as a project manager working with this, uh, working on CWGK while I was doing a one year position at the University of West Georgia. And I was like, well, I might as well apply. I just see what happens. And that's what hooked me into it, or well, at least what got me started. I was hooked on the idea of doing this type of radical social history, how we could look at these individuals on the ground. And so that's the plug, right, for the mentorship program through SCWH. Do, do that because you, you might make a connection and it could help. Um, but that's what got me started. I, I got on as Patrick was heading out the door to go to the Filson Historical Society and he left the project in good shape and I've carried it forward and we've got a, a staff of six people that work on CWGK and carrying it forward. That's what got me involved and it was, it's been a really great opportunity to come to a project that I didn't know a lot about, heard about it and then learned more about it and I see the interpretive possibilities here. So as you as you mentioned, you know this this digital project is you know it's a digital archive, and you know uh, I think there's I think the website says it houses you know more than ten thousand you know documents that came through one of the five governor's offices. I'm interested though, you know, mm -hmm. obviously there's documents from the state executives, but I I, I, mm -hmm. I wonder I was wondering if you could talk a little more specifically about what type of uh, sources this archive houses is there a particular strength in sources mm -hmm. and then and you talked about this a little bit also but i wonder if you could talk a little bit more about how a prospective researcher could use the sources in this project you know to to, to study the experience of everyday kentuckians during the civil war yeah uh so chase i think that's a really great question there's an abundance of documents as i think i said and as you said there's about 10,000 that we currently have up on the site. We, we have those documents up in two phases, what we would call early access, which are most of the documents. Uh, they've been uploaded with a digitized image and a first round kind of transcription. Part of our editorial process is we go through and we confirm those transcriptions. We call it double proofing. Once we upload those, we then go through and we annotate those documents. Uh, those annotations focus on creating biographies for every person, place, and organization within one of the documents. Um, so we've done 10, we have 10,000 that are up. We've done uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 16, 1700 that have been fully annotated, um, roughly in that neighborhood. There's another 10,000 that are kind of sitting in the hopper to upload, right? So to pitch the scale, right, there's somewhere around 20,000 documents when, when this project is all said and done. Uh, in terms of strengths though, or well, first in terms of type, uh, we have a range of documents. Most common are petitions, right? The documents that are written, uh, the, the beauty, right, of, of these governor's offices in the 19th century is that they sit at the intersection of everyday life, right? Emancipation during the war, 
the raising of armies and militias, but also ordinary everyday things, right? I was arrested for being drunk in public. Please help me remit the fine. I can't afford to pay it. My family will suffer if I am forced to pay the legal fees and end this fine. Uh, my store was robbed. Uh, I am accused of murder. I didn't commit this murder. Or my favorite, when there's people getting into a drunken brawl. I don't remember stabbing the man because I was drunk. So clearly I can't be guilty. Um, most of the things tend to deal with liquor. Um, but uh, petitions definitely are one of the biggest sources. Uh, and I think that's an area where CWGK itself is really interested in building uh, what we call social networking nodes or these social relationships. So whenever we create these entities, as we call them, a, a biography, we've got over 11,000 of these for ordinary individuals. So these could be massive and expansive for one of the governors, but they could also be just a couple sentences mentioned in the petition about this person in this place, in the hopes that as we go through and do more research, we'll learn more information about an enslaved person. We'll learn more information about this farmer from Western Kentucky. Uh, we'll learn more about women, um, so we create biographies for every person we come across, but then we also link them together to create these social networks. And as we do more of these biographies and as we link more of these people together, showing their economic relationships, their social relationships, familial relationships, uh, the hope is that you can see these threads that tie people together. Uh, and the thinking is, can we prove or, or can we interrogate whether, maybe I shouldn't say we, maybe I should say future researchers, can researchers interrogate how, how decisions are made in state government, right? Uh, do the people who sign a petition matter when they write to Thomas Bramlett or if they write to one of his predecessors like James Robinson or Beriah McGoffin, would the same people's names showing up on different petitions or different governors seeing these names have different reactions? Would they trust the names of, of some community leaders because they're unionists or at least seemingly unionists? Would they distrust the names of others? Do they trust the names of friends or family? What are the economic and social and, and political connections that underlie all of the, the networks that connect these people together? And can we, again, I'm using an imperial we, both the staff and people who use the site, can, can researchers unpack how these networks work and how they influenced decisions of the state executive? because governors wield incredible power to remit fines, to release people from prison, to pardon them for crimes. So can they, uh, can these decisions or can, can social influ factors influence and can we actually track that with these networks? I'd argue that's probably what CWGK is most focused with, uh, but there's a number of other things. We, we have military appointment records. Uh, we have, have records on casualties right after the Battle of Perryville or other skirmishes appointment records, both civil and military, right? So people jockeying for military commissions as military units are being raised, even, even though Kentucky, after it falls out of its neutrality, right, as Union and Confederate soldiers are organizing units, right? You can kind of see how this plays out. And these are sources you can get at other places, but you can see this in Kentucky as well, right? I should say it's sources, right, you can find about other states and other places, but it can help fit in that narrative of how, how do people use questions of loyalty or division in a, in a border state. Civil appointments, right, the kind of the bureaucratic connections, having to appoint notaries in different states. Right? We went through a set of documents back before COVID of um, appointments to places like Reno, Nevada, or like California and New York, or people who are notaries or representing the state of Kentucky in these different places, um, showing interstate connections. We, we have other documents um, that highlight a Brian McGoffin when he is governor at the start of the Civil War is, is at best a tepid unionist, if not like a definitely skirting the line secessionist. And the union legislature is able to keep him from doing anything by taking the, anything to take Kentucky out of the union. But there's a series of documents where McGoffin is trying to smuggle guns into Louisville to arm pro-secession militias. But uh, to get to connect to that theme that liquor shows up a lot, uh, there's the guy in New Orleans who one of his contacts is working with, who is uh, perhaps a bit inebriated through the entire process. So there's literally like a telegram from McGoffin's office that's like, I have the money and Blackburn's like passed out drunk in front of me. What do you want me to do? Cause I can't buy the, I don't want to give him the money cause I don't think we're going to get the guns. Um, so there's all of these 
uh, different connections you can see between people, uh, between the state. You can see requests for fugitives, uh, both enslaved and also criminals, white or black, right, who have committed crimes and have escaped the law. Uh, so really, there's this broad interpretive power of our sources to connect both to social events, military events, and to recapture voices uh, kind of beneath the scenes, behind, behind the scenes of ordinary people. I'm interested, you know, kind of going along with this is, you know, recently I've been reading a lot of material about kind of like the late period of the war and kind of like the unraveling that you see, uh, not just within kind of like the, you know, the, the broader national institutions of the Confederacy, but within kind of like the state institutions, the state governments themselves. I mean, do you, with, with these sources, do you see that in some of these documents? you know, as the war turns against the Confederacy, start to see a breakdown in the, the Kentucky government, at least the Confederate Kentucky government. And so I think that's actually also a fascinating point and I didn't, I didn't touch on, right? The, the idea that Kentucky has this weird situation. Um, so you certainly see the breakdown with increased guerrilla warfare. Um, but I'll, I'll touch on that first, right? One of the other things you can really see, again, I didn't mention, because um, there's so much we have, uh, is guerrilla warfare. Uh, we've got subject tags that focus on guerrilla warfare. Matt Holbert, um, Patrick Lewis, and other, a number of other people have talked about the um, guerrilla aspects of Kentucky. Andrew Fialka as well, right? Fialka focuses a lot on GIS and, and mapping. And actually, I think he was in your last interview series, right? Uh, he finds Kentucky's guerrilla warfare compared to like Missouri, his research to be just insane. Whereas like in Missouri, there's a discernible pattern of like union presence, emancipation, guerrilla activity. Kentucky, it's just like guerrilla activity everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Um, so you certainly see that as the war goes on and as partisan tensions or, or divisions increase in the state, you see this increase in guerrilla violence. Uh, it's more like local warlords, um, kind of comparable to modern conflicts uh, we could think of in the Middle East, right? It, it's more of these local individuals writing to the state saying, hey, don't worry, I'm going to take care of the situation. Just, you don't worry about the thing, just give me the guns and the ammunition. I'll solve all of our problems. Uh, so, so certainly you see that kind of breakdown as guerrilla warfare increases. Um, but the Confederate government is also really interesting. One of the, one of the documents we have is this provisional government ledger. Uh, because the Kentucky government for the Confederacy is first in Bowling Green, is then expelled from the state, right, as Union forces occupy Kentucky. They occupy Frankfurt for about a day, right, uh, while Jane, um, while Richard Hawes is governor, right, he comes in, he gives a speech and saying, uh, citizens of Kentucky, you've been freed from the tyranny of the Union's occupation. And then literally, like, if this was a Ken Burns or some type of documentary, you'd hear the gunfire in the distance, and Hawes is like, and I'm out, and he, like, packs up and they flee Frankfurt, right? Slight over dramatization, but like he gives his speech, he's inaugurated and then he leaves uh, because Union troops return and push them out. So piecing together Kentucky's Confederate government is mostly a government in exile and mostly a government that is cobbling things together, right? They are occupying homes and they're like, okay, how do we create a government? How do we collect taxes, right? And then you have the, the people who are both occupied by the Confederacy and Union Kentucky governments in the same year. And both governments, like the Confederate government will collect taxes. And then the Union tax collectors come around and they're like, so where's a, we need those taxes. And they're like, we already paid to the other guys. And so you, you get these interesting moments where um, a government is trying to be formed and exert control, but it's very much in a vacuum where they don't have a lot of space. And um, you can kind of, you can kind of see how it forms, but it really is a government that's mostly conducted from like Georgia because uh, George Johnson serves as the first governor. When he's evicted, he, ser he actually enlists as a private in uh, the battle of Sh at the Battle of Shiloh and is mortally wounded and dies as a result. And then Richard Hawes becomes the provisional governor, the second provisional governor, but he spends, like I said, very little time actually administering the state because Again, if we think about what the project is trying to do, right, it's to flip this narrative to be like, well, actually, this is mostly a union state. And it's only after the war that we see this Confederate resurgence or this Confederate memory that develops. It's largely a state that is 
officiated by the union and right I, most of the documents we have actually focus on the union side to counter the memory the persistent memory of the civil war from a confederate perspective in kentucky um so the project uh in addition, just you know, for the searchable archive, also features a number of uh, digital exhibits, and these are really <laughs> fascinating uh, exhibits. I was wondering if you could talk just a little bit about uh, some of the digital exhibits that are available for people to view, and then you know, what kind of information uh, researchers can gather from these exhibits. I I'm thinking in particular of the Caroline Chronicles, mm -hmm. and um, I think it's from where I now stand. The trials of Edward Buffin, I believe is how you pronounce his name. Yeah. Yeah, buff them, buff them. Yeah. Um, right. So yeah, we've got these exhibits that we've put together and we're planning on building more in the future. But uh, the keys of these exhibits, especially early on, is to kind of connect back to some of the other questions you've had is how can we use these documents to interpret? Um, by far, our most popular one is the story of Caroline, uh, an enslaved woman from Tennessee who follows Don Carlos Buell's army, arrives in Louisville, uh, is arrested for being a essentially a slave without a master and sent to live with the Levy family or the Levi family. Uh, and while there, she is accused of killing Blanche, the daughter of the family, uh, with poison, right? She's accused. She goes to trial. She's um, going to be executed. And a group of Louisvillians intercede, appeal to Thomas Bramlett in 1863, and are able to get her sentence commuted. Um, and then uh, we lose her um, when she steps out of the Jefferson County Courthouse, right? She kind of disappears. Um, but the exhibit, right, uses uh, a number of different perspectives, right? It, it offers teaching opportunities. Uh, essentially, is, right, these exhibits are an opportunity to pull together stories and offer interpretation um, in a way that we've, we've published articles. And actually, I'd, I'd meant to mention this before with one of your other questions, right? If, you're thinking of way people can interpret these sources. We, we published a special issue of the Register, uh, Civil War Governor's issue last year. There's 12 articles in here. Uh, Stephen, uh, Stephen Barry, uh, Leslie Gordon, Amy Taylor, who was also a contributor and a guest editor, Carol Emberton, uh, and a number of other people. I'm not going to list all of them, but uh, it's a great series of, of how people interrogated these documents, uh, used the documents, right? And one of them is Car uh, Caroline. Uh, so we use Caroline's exhibit, right, to kind of um, highlight how we can recapture an enslaved voice. Uh, and our hope, right, we found Caroline very early. And the idea was, wow, this, this, this proves, right, the proof of concept uh, of what we can do with CWGK. We can recapture these voices. That There's a document from Caroline, Caroline's perspective, uh, very much mediated through a, a third party, through someone who recorded her statement, right, on, on the events that happened. But we're specifically able to recapture her voice, uh, interpret the events that surround it, and, and provide some discussion, right, posing questions, posing ways that people can dive into her voice. Ultimately, we still know more about the Levi family, the, the family that she, that kind of took custody of her while she was in the city until her master could reclaim her throughout the, uh, the archive, right. CWGK can certainly push back on the the archival silences that exist. And I think this is where I see the project really coming in. And this connects to Buffum too, right? That the project can highlight silences, but it is in many ways a, a digital construction of, of uh, other archives, right? We, we use the Kentucky Department of Library and Archives. We've pulled from the Filsons, a little bit from Maker's Mark uh, and a few other places, right? We've, we've pulled these collections together, but they're still reminiscent of the, of the silences that are, are existent or, or have always existed in historical archives that privilege certain voices and ignore others. We can use uh, Caroline's right to highlight an enslaved voice and how we can read documents against the grain and give personhood and give some sense of control or agency to individuals. Uh, we can use Buffum's right if we think of uh, a Medal of Honor winning soldier who uh, deals with a lot of mental illness and struggles right and eventually commits suicide after the war uh, to fit into that narrative of the dark turn right of the of the darker sides of the war looking at how trauma and the conflict led to increased drinking led to uh, struggles with mental health uh, so 
although, right, those are a small portion, right? Caroline's story is a very small portion. Uh, Buffum's story is, is a small segment of what we offer with CWGK. It allows us, and we demonstrate, right, how you can use the site by interrogating these sources and drawing new conclusions, or, or at least being able to engage in new conversations and recapture part of Caroline's story, recapture part of Buffum's story. Uh, and we've got a couple other, right, like subject guides in there, one that kind of ties in this exhibit that breaks down like legal terms or shows off different types of legal documents. Uh, the, again, the Imperial We, the, many of the early founders of this project had, as I've been told, the horror stories of a room that was covered with post-it notes, trying to break down the, the structure of what Kentucky government legally, politically, all looked like during the, 18, uh, the 1860s. Um, so we've, right, we've taken that. And so when you get a document that's like an affidavit or you get things that researchers might know about, but if they have questions about what these different documents mean. Um, so we use these exhibits as ways to both showcase what we can offer, but also right, the interpretive possibilities of the project. And you throw in the register issue and you throw in uh, blog posts and other things we've done. It's the opportunity to engage engage the public and our hope I'm working on one or fingers crossed right the plan for next year is to work on one uh, about a murder case I came across in Caldwell County Kentucky that focuses on uh, two individuals who get into an argument their neighbors uh, the man who was killed is actually the stepson of the guy who killed him's wife right there's all of these deep interconnections that are sort of familial social and economic and the hope would be there's about uh, 99 documents we have that tied to this case. Uh, a lot of them deal with petitions and we could unpack the petition writing process. There's about 87 petitions that are written for this case and most of them have the same exact language that's copy and pasted. Air quotes, copy and pasted for the 1860s. That's almost verbatim the same, which I assume the people who transcribed it probably lost their mind as they read like 80 documents in a row that were almost exactly the same. Um, but give us that question. There's, there's questions of fraud that are raised in the petition writing process. Um, but it'll also give us that opportunity for the, those social networking nodes to have a good base of petitions, tie them together and show how these connections worked and how they influenced the outcome of this case. And right, it's also got that there's true crime stories because we don't really know what happens because there's conflicting evidence of the people who shot first and um, the lead up to the case. So it's Hopefully that's the next case that is, or the next exhibit that's coming to offer that, right, that we're just going to catch in on the true crime craze that's sweeping America and hopefully people will find it a little interesting. So in addition to kind of like with these digital exhibits, in addition to kind of laying out these stories, they also offer uh, a lot of um, resources for teachers to to teach these uh, digital exhibits. But the site as a whole, that's kind of one of the first things you notice when you when you uh, visit the website is immediately there's a for teachers tab and just about everything you click on, there's a company uh, accompanying resources uh, for teachers. So I was wondering if you could talk just a little bit about uh, what the project offers in terms of resources for teachers and perhaps maybe uh, some examples that you've seen or are done yourself in terms of incorporating this project into a classroom. Yeah, uh, I, I think I think the teaching um, activities, opportunities, we have resources, the word I was struggling to find there, uh, the teaching resources in the exhibits kind of come from a core philosophy behind CWGK, right? It doesn't matter if we throw out 10,000 documents. What good is it if we don't interpret it or we don't provide avenues for people to engage it? Uh, obviously, this is was conceived or, or functions largely as a scholarly archive, right? Graduate students, researchers dive in and can pull great stories out. But we also want it to be more than that, right? Like, it doesn't matter how much good history we do on the back end that, get pub that gets published in journals or blog posts that are very smallly read or make their way into great books or dissertations, right? All of those things are great markers of success, but if it's not, right, we can think of contemporary events, uh, questions about education, right? If we don't offer more perspectives, if we don't offer more resources, it doesn't really do our archive any good to just have digitized them and remove them from one archive, but to put them in another space. Uh, so that's the idea, right, that animates the exhibits. It shows you how to do, how to do it or how to either do the research or some of the interpretations we've drawn. 
but it also drives the teaching aspect, right? The, the opportunity that we've created resources and we've provided ways for teachers. Uh, and we've tried to gear them mostly towards high school, college, um, but we're working on ways to, to broaden these out, right? For Kentucky teachers and really for anyone, I, my hope is that we can offer these resources that can be broad, but also at the same time specific and, and really be flexible, right? Broad and flexible ways that teachers can apply them to their classroom. Um, I've taught classes and I know I very rarely take things that are prepackaged. I will take things and I gut them, right? The, the grad school teaching that you get, right? Is to, to gut things and take what's useful to you and kind of, because uh, you only have so much brain power to kind of put the other stuff in a bin off to the side. Um, so our, my, my hope has always been that our teaching resources would be uh, flexible, but uh, I kind of break them down into three, I'll break them down into like three different categories. Um, one are these activities that we have created and we're, we're working on one currently uh, that is supported by the NEH, uh, but the, the idea is to create uh, an activity lesson plan and whatever you want to call it on um, non-elite women's economy, right? people that are or even more than, in, um, well, I shouldn't say more. One of, the, one of the groups we run into trouble finding a lot about, right, is women. Most of these petitions are written by men. They're signed by men, sent to the state governors. We're dealing, right, if we think of separate spheres, spheres ideology, mostly things that are in the public. But women show up um, in many different ways throughout these documents. So how can we track the experience and lives of women and how can we use these documents to talk about ordinary women and how they're dealing with economic and social issues during the war. Uh, but we've got a couple others, and, and one that I think is the most exciting um, is what we call CWGK Farmville. Uh, it is an agricultural simulator game. So essentially the way it works is you can print it out and you can essentially create a board. It's got uh, four sides, one that represents largely each year of the war. There's tiles, you, you roll a dice and you move whatever token you have, right? The idea is you can print this as a, in a college or high school classroom and print it off and you can kind of use whatever you want. And as you move through each tile, it, if you think of this as like the Civil War version of Monopoly, where you land in a different space and you draw a card, um, all of them are the chance tile that you land on. And basically you get a certain amount of points you assign to different activities. Um, do you want to invest in, I think you have 16 out, like 16 points that represent 16 hours of the working day as a farmer. Um, do you want to assign them to raising hogs? Do you want to assign them to raising a cash crop like tobacco or uh, indigo or something along those lines? Um, do you want to specialize in grain or whiskey, corn? And you assign those. And then as you go around the board simulating each year of the war, you land on an event space, you draw a card. And the card could be a military event. It could be an environmental, a social, or political. Uh, but they're all drawn from our documents. So it'll be something along the lines of like, a Union Army regiment shows up and takes all of your pigs. Anyone who has pigs loses points for this round or, or year. And the, the goal, right, is at the end of the game to see who's managed their farm the best. But it allows students to see how random events, right, depending on the choices you make with uh, the crops and the things you have and what shows up or what environmental factors arise impact your war. Right? So it's supposed to be interactive. It's, it's a game, but it's a game that's based in our documents. It's to get an air quotes game, right? But it's a simulation to get people to learn. Um, we also have, and this might be a big one for this year, there's one that was done for our 18, an 1864 election. Um, that provides both background context to the election, but then also voting cards for every individual student in the classroom. Some will be women, some will be African Americans, some will be men, and they'll have different partisan affiliations. And those people that can't vote in 1864 are excluded. Those that can vote have a persona that's again based in our documents and a rationale of who they would vote for. And then the teacher can use that to explain kind of how the election of 1864 both went broadly, but also locally in Kentucky, um, right? So these are, these are activities, these are things that kind of come pre-packaged that you can take and use and apply to a classroom. Uh, we have others which are learning themes, which are, here's uh, a little background on like agricultural history in Kentucky or crime or uh, legal history. And they come with uh, five to 10 primary sources that you could use. And, these are much broader and they're kind of like, here's the documents. 
use them how you will, or if you, right, our hope is that somebody who's searching online or running through the site might be like, man, I really want to teach about emancipation. Oh, here's, here's just a bunch of documents about emancipation for Kentucky. I can pull those. Um, and the last part, part are these kind of um, what I call them like uh, short samples or these short little snippets of I provide a couple, and these are a couple ones I created, just one on guerrilla warfare. I offered, here are a couple articles, read these for background context. Here are a couple of primary sources. Here are some discussion questions. If you use all of these, that you can essentially, again, this idea of flexibility, that a, a graduate student, or a high school teacher who's struggling for time and they wanna talk about something, um, they can grab this, they can do either background reading if they want, or they can just grab a couple primary sources, either use those questions or have them operate as like um, inspiration for, few, for, for their own questions. But the idea is to provide teachers of all stripes with um, tools they can use to interrogate these sources and get students to read them. So that's, uh, I don't know if that was a short answer that you asked for, but it was a, a broad answer of kind of all the different uh, teaching resources that we have. So again, putting these documents just, they're not just static and they're not just there, but we're providing resources and how you can turn these into the classroom or you can turn these into teachable moments for students. Yeah, that um, the board games sound wonderful, by the way. I'm very tempted after this to go print them off <laughs> and start playing them myself. Yeah. But it's so interesting. I mean, there's so many conversations right now about, you know, how do we how do we get people engaged with history? And, you know, it sounds like from what you're describing is there's, you know, a whole treasure chest full of different uh, methods that mm -hmm. teachers could use uh, to get people engaged and excited about learning about the Civil War and the Civil War uh, in Kentucky. Um, but in mm -hmm. addition to teachers, um, this digital project also offers, I think, a number of opportunities and resources to graduate students and early career scholars. So I was wondering if you could mm -hmm. talk just a little about a little bit about you know the resources, you know, research opportunities, career development opportunities that this project offers to graduate students and early career scholars. Yeah, um, to be honest, right, CWGK, we, we've got an on-site staff, and we do a lot of work here, but. We've also relied uh, for the past several years on a number of graduate students. We've had 14 graduate students serve as uh, graduate research associates, uh, funded by uh, the NHPRC, the National Historical Publications and Records Commission. I always flip flop the letters like in the alphabet soup somewhere in the middle, so I'm happy I got that right there. Um, but the NHPRC funds these graduate students that we have uh, they will do research for us. They, they usually do about 150 documents that they'll annotate. So they help with that kind of first level of research. We really tap into their skills. So if you are a graduate student who's interested in, in learning more about how to do research, but also get the back end experience of, um, right, we, we are the kind of growth of digital documentary history, right? The um, volumes of, that were popular, well, I don't know if popular is the right word over the summer with the Andrew Jackson papers, but if we think of Jefferson and Lincoln papers, right? The, the massive thick volumes, Ira Berlin's um, series on African-American history, right? These massive tomes that compile primary sources, right? That's really what CWGK is um, at its conceptual heart for a modern age. Um, we give experience, right, with, with kind of the annotation side of that, but doing the research into individual people, organizations, places. Um, we, fu we funded 14 of these uh, graduate students over the years. After the early years of, of taking six or eight on in the first year, uh, that was a little, little too many people. Uh, the project learned that if we get really good uh, groups of two students, we get them really focused and have deep hands-on training, um, it's a great opportunity, I think, for graduate students to both, right, not that graduate students really need to hone their research skills, but you get a little bit more practice honing your research skills, but really seeing the back end of a digital project, sitting on meetings where we talk about editorial, po editorial policy, right, the, the most fascinating thing, right, is we have deep questions about how should we annotate steamboats, um, surprisingly a question that, that kept coming up for several, several months at one period, right, but but how do, how do we do the research and why do we do and write things the way we do and getting involved in using different uh, technological tools and learning how we do things behind the scenes. Uh, 
that's probably one of the largest ways that graduate students are, or maybe the most direct way. Uh, the other thing I mentioned, or I think I mentioned this in passing, is CWGK has a blog. Um, and we have been, as a complement to that CWGK special issue where, again, a large number of great scholars came in and contributed um, to, to, to that. There was a symposium in 2017 and those articles were turned in, or those presentations were turned into articles. Uh, I wanted to start seeding research into graduate students. So I've been reaching out to graduate students, either past GRAs or people I've encountered at conferences, um, inviting them. And right as people watch this, as I know, tons and tons of people will watch this interview. If you're interested in writing blog posts for CWGK, uh, really what we want is we want people to come in, play around, find cool stories, right? You may find stories that we already know about. You may find stories we haven't uncovered yet, but come in and use those uh, resources to write a blog post, right? Um, as we get into a, an era, right? COVID has revealed a number of faults in a academia and the world writ large. Um, anything you can do, right, to kind of get your name out there. Uh, and I also hope, right, by coming in and doing research, we, you tap into the other largest resource we have, which is all the documents. We're, we're just waiting on that dissertation or, or book to come out that's built off of CWGK documents. There's, t there's 10,000. You don't have to leave your house, right? Like, and that's A, a benefit in the COVID world. You don't have to worry about interacting with people. But also, um, for writing a dissertation, you don't have to worry about funding. You can do the research from your home. Um, graduate advisors are probably going to watch this and go, oh, no, 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 don't do that. Um, don't, don't write your dissertation just based on CWGK. But it can be a great place to go and look for those resources. And, and we have research fellowships here. Uh, one of my colleagues, Stephanie Lang, uh, and uh, her team um, run the fellowship program again at some point in the future. Um, we will have people back on site, right? And you can come and you can connect to other documents that we have on CETA, uh, at KHS. So you can come to beautiful Frankfort, Kentucky. You can come to Central Kentucky and connect to some of the resources we have CWGK, right, can be kind of that linchpin into, you get to know us, you get to know what KHS and CWGK do, and then you can make your way to Frankfurt um, and find out more of the resources that we have to, to paint that broader picture of what you can learn about the Civil War era here. So uh, doing the GRAs, usually if, knock on wood, everything goes well, we kind of notify people about those in, in December uh, of any given year in the hopes that we would interview in January and have people starting sometime in February. They'd have a year to go through our training. It is, it is compensated, right? That's the biggest attraction. Uh, we do pay people for that. I should have led with that, shouldn't I have? Um, but we, we compensate them. You get those research experience. You, you get that experience with digital history, um, write a blog post, do research, uh, and bring yourself to KHS. I think that's, those are the, the big ways that people can get involved. And, and I said graduate students a lot. I also mean early, well, not the graduate research assistantship, but early career scholars, the blog posts, come do research. The, the bounty of what we have is, is, I'd say unimaginable, but it is quantifiable in, in that we have eventually 20,000 documents for you to use. Yeah, it's such, it sounds like it's such a, a valuable uh, opportunity and there's so much potential, just the skills you can learn and, you know, doing internships at a, for a, for a digital project, you know, in this job market, anything that can separate you, you know, mm -hmm. from, the, from the rest of the field is going to be, is going to be worthwhile your time. Um, before we move in kind of into a walkthrough of the yeah. website, I'm just curious, you know, uh, what's on, what's on the horizon for Civil War Governors Kentucky? Is there anything right now that's currently in development? I know you mentioned a few things during our conversation, but I want mm -hmm. to just give a little insight into to what's going on yeah, and going forward. Sure. Yeah, you know, I think, I think there's a couple of big things, right? And I'd be lying if I didn't say that I think some of our thoughts um, on what CWGK is, is definitely being impacted by events going around in 2020. Um, what I was saying before, right, with COVID effect, affecting academia, uh, seeing the social tensions, uh, right, kind of the, the legacies of, or maybe I should say the unresolved legacies of the Civil War bearing fruit in 2020, um, when the project was conceived, right, it was conceived, as I said, as a sesquicentennial project to run from 60 to 65. Boom, let's better understand the Civil War. Uh, one of the questions we have to wrestle with as, as a staff in, in the larger orbit of, of KHS is, 
what do we do about that also important period of reconstruction that comes afterwards? Uh, how, how do we tackle the story, right? We offer a great deal of, of speculation and, and insight into what happens in Kentucky after 1865, after slavery ends and freed African Americans and white Kentuckians enter into this new world. But I think we've proven uh, that there's a great deal to interpret here in Kentucky and during the Civil War period. And I think there's an equal amount, uh, if not even greater insights to find in Reconstruction. That's not saying um, that we're definitely going into Reconstruction. We have to find a way. I, it would be my ideal goal, but you know, best laid plans are at the best of intentions. Uh, that's definitely one thing we have to, we have to think about. What, what are we gonna do about that period that comes after the Civil War? How do we define that? Um, and in part, that conversation is coming from another big thing we have to think about. Uh, there is a developing Civil War Governors Consortium. Uh, KHS is the first one. We created CWGK first, uh, but there are several other projects that are following uh, in cooperation with us. Uh, I am in many ways truly blessed. I get to work with Susanna Ural at the University of Southern Mississippi uh, and Leslie Gordon and Julia Brock at the University of Alabama both which are creating their own projects. Uh, if you follow on social media, Facebook and Twitter, you saw that uh, Susanna Ural's project, the Civil War and Reconstruction Governors of Mississippi, recently launched uh, their, own web, uh, their own sample documents website. Uh, and the Civil War and Reconstruction Governors of Alabama are coming along, they're digitizing documents and they're gonna be starting up their own website in the near future. All three of us are working together though uh, on a kind of a, a loosely collaborative, like maybe loosely is the wrong word. We were working on a collaborative, multi-institutional uh, cooperative where we are trying to put together, right, this comparative network. How can we see same questions in Kentucky? How can we find Carolines in Mississippi or Alabama? Can we find other individuals and other stories? Can we offer comparative data? Uh, all of the projects have their own ideas and they're gonna look different. Um, but we're kind of animated by the same questions and desires. Uh, we've got some joint presentations coming up in the future. None have, that have been publicly announced, but keep your eyes out throughout October. There's going to be at least one presentation then. Um, but that's definitely something that's big. We're, we're putting in a couple of conference presentations. If, if not for COVID, we would have been at the Society of Military Historians back in May or June talking about our projects. Um, hopefully next year conferences will return and we'll get to talk about them. Uh, but right, the idea that KHS, CWGK is working with these other institutions and, and kind of leading the charge and, and there's interest in a couple of other states. So hopefully we can recruit, right? The best way we can help out graduate students and early career scholars is just to create new jobs with new projects, right? Um, with all of the funding that's out there. Um, and, and lastly, kind of on a, on a much smaller scale, right? I went from like the, the theoretical reconstruction and a national organization to just on our CWGK site, what, one of the things, and I can show this off as we go through, we want to start applying subject tags to documents. Um, we've, one of the things we haven't done, right, we haven't wanted to mediate the experience too much of end users, of people who are using the site, but we want to put these subject tags in so you can, if you see a document that has something about African American history, you can click on that, uh, or you can go on to our site and you can click on a tag that says African American history, and it'll pull up all the documents that connect to that, or guerrilla warfare, and, we have that in some forms, but we want to expand that to cover all of the documents. And our hope would be that that will promote how and you, how I keep using really technical jargon, right? How, how researchers and how people who are on the site will end up using it. Um, that, that is our hope with the, um, the subject tags that we want to apply. Those are, those are in development and, and will come at some point. All right, so what I'll do, uh, Thank you again, Chase, for the opportunity to talk. What, what I'll do now is I'll run you through some of the key things that we have on CWGK, some of the, the different ways you can use the site uh, and show off some of the things that we have where you can find different uh, resources and different things on the site. So if you want to access CWGK, uh, the place to go is discovery.civilwargovernors.org. That's the main website. Uh, it'll take you to this landing page that's here. You've got the wonderful picture. Uh, we love our Civil War governors with beards in Kentucky. So you've got a picture of Brian McGoffin with his huge bushy beard up front. Uh, this is the main landing page, like I said. Uh, it gives an overview of the project, 
uh, lists the number of people that are featured um, or supported us. If you want to access our blog down at the bottom, you can click here. Um, sorry, the feature exhibit that highlights Buffum, one of our last exhibits. If you want to go to our blog, you can click on the news link down here, and that should pop you over to another site. Uh, this will take us to an earlier site that we have that we still use kind of as our blog shell, uh, civilwargovernors.org. That'll take you there and you can explore the different blog posts that we've had. This is our most recent one from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I guess actually in terms of COVID time and much longer ago, it seems like it was just the other day. Um, but that is our blog site. You can access other uh, past blogs over here on the side or scroll through the news section over here. Um, to go back to the main site, there's a couple of things I'll point out here. Um, I'll come back later. I'll kind of show you all the bells and whistles that we have. I'll show you how you can then research and some of the best ways to use the site uh, using this bar here. Um, if you're interested in with this about tab, right, I'll go through these top tabs up above. Um, depending on what you're interested in learning about, you can use this tab to learn a lot about the background of the project. Uh, if you want to learn more about me or the project staff, you can click on that first tab. Uh, if you're interested in learning about all of the past graduate research associates, uh, you can click here. And this will fire up. It gives a brief description of our GRA, um, GRA positions. And then it runs through uh, this year. Aaron Phillips from the University of Alabama and Kristen Bailey from West Virginia University are our, our research associates. Uh, but you can run through and you can see all of the past colleagues that we've pulled from. Uh, again, right, if we're talking about opportunities for graduate students, this is uh, one of the ways, right, we, we not only give you the skills and the experiences, um, but you get your name up there and you're going to always be associated with the project. Uh, we also have, I'm not going to show these off because they're lots of text. Uh, we have information on our early access document selection, right, how we went about choosing and selecting the documents, uh, the editorial policy we use, how we built Omeka in the re a report on Omeka for documentary editions, um, and also how we use uh, what we call MASH bill. It is, right, the most Kentucky name that we could come up for something, uh, right, based on um, the MASH bill that's used in bourbon recipes. Uh, but it is the software, it's the glue that holds uh, the annotations, as I'll show you later, of CWGK, all the research and the interactive elements together. It allows us to store information on these people and create the social networks. So the more you want to learn about the project, you can go to this About tab. Um, as a reference, uh, the Reference tab, right, this provides biographies on the individual governors, um, right? Although the project, although CWGK focuses on interpreting the lives of individual Kentuckians uh, and individual people, we do still right, focus on those nominal governors. Uh, you can click on any one of these biographies and you can learn more, right? You can click on Mariah McGoffin. It'll give you uh, basic information, right? Party, when he's in office, what his occupation was, and it goes into a detailed biography about um, McGoffin and all of the other governors. If you want to learn more about, uh, more to read about Kentucky history, uh, if you want to see how uh, Kentucky breaks down um, politically, right, and, and judicially, uh, the different congressional representatives, right, if, if you're thinking, okay, well, I'm researching in this county, who do I, who do I need to know who are the big politicians or the influential figures? Uh, previous generations of staff have put these maps together, right, that will lay out the state lay out all of the information of the people who are representing Kentucky in Congress, what county they're from, the party they're a part of, um, same thing with senators, and it goes through the entire um, Civil War period, right? So this is just information, these first two tabs uh, that kind of lay out all the background information you could need to know right, um, about Civil War Kentucky. Again, trying to place this larger narrative in uh, of the documents into uh, ways you can interpret and ways you can understand Civil War Kentucky. Um, 
the next tab over, uh, the Browse tab, is one of the ways you can access our documents. And actually, I'll, I'll return to this in a little bit um, because I, I feel like actually spending some time on how to look at our documents will be important. Um, the exhibits that Chase had mentioned earlier and that I had talked about uh, come on this fourth tab. On this one, you can click and it'll pull up each of the different individual exhibits that we have. Uh, like I mentioned, there's the Caroline Chronicles. You can select this and it'll take you into uh, Caroline's, this story that we lay out about Caroline, providing you with a background. You can follow it here. You can, if you want to go straight to learning about teaching, you can go here uh, to the Teach the Caroline Chronicles. It'll pull up uh, PDF packets that we have, right? One of the things we've tried to do for ease of access is combine all of the resources that you would need for teaching something like Caroline together. Um, if you want to dive into Caroline's story, uh, you, Patrick Lewis and Matt Holbert several years ago worked together and created both on our blog and on the site here, uh, a series of linked stories that lay out Caroline's uh, case, what happened to her. Uh, they did some, a little bit of, uh, they took some artistical or interpretive liberties, laying out how, uh, the prosecution's case using documents, laying out the defense's case, uh, and talking about things like the decision, her husband that we know exists, but how they had to build out who this person was because he kind of exists in a amorphous state of who is this individual. Um, and then of course you can uh, hear a talk about it or even explore the individual documents laid out here. Um, again, with that exhibit tab, you can find these exhibits here. Uh, the subject guides uh, lay out uh, different, again, as I'd mentioned, different subject guides that we're starting to compile or some of them have already been compiled and we're building out newer ones that connect to different kind of thematic clusters of documents. Uh, so if you're interested in any of these topics about food and farming, slavery and capitalism, the military history or guerrilla warfare, we've got those subject guides and you can dive right into essentially a curated set of documents. Uh, for teachers, that's what this last tab is. You can click on that and it'll bring up um, the different teaching themes we have, right? Uh, the first group of documents we have are, these are the teaching themes. One, if you're looking to introduce students to primary sources and how to use them, we have uh, an interpretive setup for that. Uh, we also have ones on the meaning of the union, women involved in the war, uh, crime, agriculture, religion, telling the story, a short story competition we had created, um, and about energy in Kentucky. Uh, for these themes, as I mentioned before, if you click on one of them, uh, it'll bring up uh, using, it'll bring up context, right? It gives you background. Uh, you can download the entire theme with a click, or if you want to look at individual documents, we have them here. We offer questions and we provide some activities uh, and secondary literature that you can use uh, again, right, keeping the idea of flexibility in mind. Teachers, you can come in, you can use this, or graduate students, teachers, uh, tenured faculty, you can come in, you can pull documents, you can pull questions, you can pull readings or activities, and tweak them or be inspired by them to use in your own classroom. Uh, below those different teaching themes, we also have uh, the classroom packets. Right, we've got one for Caroline, we've got one for Buffum. Uh, we also have one for the 1864 presidential election. Uh, again, since it's an election year, I'll click on this one just to show you. Very similar to the theme, we offer some context, a description of what the packet includes, and then a link that you can click on. And I believe if you click on this, you do have to provide us with a little bit of information, but when you fill all of this out, we will email you uh, a copy of a PDF of all of the documents uh, pertaining to that lesson. Uh, again, it provides you with all of the components, the, the tools you need to run the activity and the instructions um, and links and descriptions and transcriptions of the documents. Uh, so that lays out broadly what we have as kind of the peripheral or additional stuff to CWGK. So there are a couple of different ways, uh, and I'll show you the different ways you can search for documents 
uh, on CWGK. Like I said, we've got about 10,000 documents, so it's really easy to get lost in, in there, right? You can fall down rabbit holes. Uh, and that's both the beauty and kind of the peril of this site. Uh, I'll first show you how to use the search bar. Uh, I've got a couple, I'll use a couple terms and I know a couple of specific individuals that I can pull up, show you some of these connections and, and the different things that I've talked about. Um, so one of the things you might want to search is African American, right? Uh, a, a generic term. Um, the one thing about our site is it's very specific um, when you put in and use the Omeka search. So as you can see, right, we have more than 43 documents and 43 results for African Americans. Uh, but what you will first see uh, when you come up is there'll be these, uh, both the uh, either exhibits or topical um, themes that are lesson plans that we have created and put up. Uh, you'll see organizations, the American Party specifically mentions African or American in there. Um, let's see if we can get to some documents. Uh, after it goes through all of those, it'll also bring you to different documents. So I'm just going to click on this very first one, uh, James T. Lewis Thanksgiving Proclamation. Now, uh, this is a very basic doc document, right? And what we provide on one hand, and this is actually coming from the state of Wisconsin, uh, on the left hand side of every document you pull up, there is a trans, uh, as an image of the document. So uh, if you have any questions about what is transcribed, provided, you can zoom in, right, to deep, deep levels. Uh, it seems my internet's being a little slow. Uh, but you can actually zoom in to see the transcription, uh, what is there, but you can also see the transcription, right? Again, we want to provide the opportunity for you to have the ease of access, but also to be able to see the original task, uh, text. Um, so you can search for broad terms, right, like that, uh, like African American. Um, but you can also search for individuals. So I'm going to search for Thomas Wadlington, and as you can see from my search results, I have searched Thomas Wadlington several times. He's uh, a fascinating individual, the man involved in the murder case I was talking about earlier. Uh, and as you can see on the left-hand side here, we pull up different item types every time you search for something. So you could search for documents. Um, again, because I put Thomas and Wadlington in, the site is searching for every instance of Thomas and Wadlington. If I used uh, quotation marks, I could limit it to just Thomas and Wadlington. Um, but not only do we have the individual documents, but you can also pull up the individual profiles of an individual. So I'm going to pull up Thomas B. Wadlington's uh, entity or profile right here. So this is one of the research biographies that we've created. Um, and we're just starting to work on, on Thomas Wadlington. So you can see uh, a couple of different things here. On the left, that's a very small social networking node that I was talking about. Uh, these we build up in every document we annotate that mentions one of these people will get connected and will expand out and will go grow larger. Uh, and I'll in a second, I'll show you one for one of the governors that's basically unusable because it's so expensive. Uh, but you can also see a basic biography, uh, where Wadlington is from, who were his parents, who is he married to, who is his, who were his children, uh, what were his, what was his occupation, and where did he live. Uh, we cite all of that information, the different uh, uh, places it comes from. Uh, you can also see metadata, right? Rough birth date, death date, uh, gender, uh, race, the type of entity that it is. You can grab the citation, right? You don't have to fuss around trying to figure out how to cite this in the footnote. We've already done that. Uh, you may also see all the documents, and again, right, we've got Wadlington only specifically mentioned or tagged in one document right now, but we're working on building up a couple others. Um, this is a great way to track down individuals and find the documents that they show up in. So if you find a character or an individual who's fascinating to you, you can see all the other documents that they appear in. And you can click on that document and it'll take you directly to the page. And this is a, uh, one of the documents that we would consider annotated and published. So again, we see the transcription on the left, 
but you also see the blue hyperlinks on the left of every person, place, and organization that has been identified in uh, a document here. So you can see the state of Kentucky, uh, the county, top, Wadlington's wife, uh, Wadlington himself, Milton Cartwright, the man he kills, the governor, and then uh, other individuals. And this lays out, as you go through the document, every single individual, uh, every place, Princeton, where uh, the court case is and the local uh, community. Uh, a couple other things you can do, right? Again, we've got the citation for the document, uh, just like we did for the citation for Wadlington's biography. And you can also download either the XML, the code behind this document, or you can download a copy of the PDF itself. Um, so again, we provide you with a number of different opportunities to access uh, these documents and the interpretive resources. As I mentioned, I was going to show you a governor. Uh, I'm going to click on this governor here, Brian McGoffin. Now, it's going to take a second to load, right, and see a slightly larger bibliography but that social networking node is taking a little bit longer. And that's because the governors show up in so many documents. Um, I don't even know if it's actually going to load. Uh, I do have another one pulled up just in case. Now let me click over. Uh, okay. Here we go. This is uh, Thomas Bramlett, Tom Elliott Bramlett, uh, the third governor for the union side uh, in our digital documentary edition. As you can see, this is a massively linked network of, of people, places, organizations. It's far too much. Um, our hope uh, is that you can use these networks, and I'm actually gonna click over to the one from Caroline DeMet, uh, who we, I had talked about earlier. This is a little bit more useful of a node. Um, again, these social networking nodes, as we call them, they are kind of the centerpieces that connect uh, our project together. Every one of those annotations, those blue hyperlinks you saw, linked uh, people places uh, together. And you can follow the, uh, the key over here on the left-hand side of the social networking node to see uh, Caroline, this blue dot in here, to all of the documents that she's connected to, and then how those documents connect out to every single individual that signed a petition, every single individual that was involved uh, in her life in some way, whether directly or indirectly or peripherally. Uh, that again, I think is kind of the interpretive or what I hope is the interpretive power of CWGK is that you can, as we annotate more documents and as we build this out, you can see these social networks grow. Hopefully, maybe not to the level of a Thomas Bramlett or a Mariah McGoffin, um, but to a larger level where you can, you can see the threads and the ties that pull these people and these individuals together. Uh, another way that you might want to search our site, if you click on the browse tag uh, up at the top, you can search individual archives, right? So we've pulled things from the Kentucky Department for Library and Archives, the Kentucky Department for Military Affairs, from KHS, from the Filson, the Mary Todd Lincoln House, Maker's Mark. Uh, so I'll just click on the one from KDLA first, just to show you. Uh, this will pull up the different collections. So you, depending on how you want to search. If you just want to search for terms or individual people, uh, you can search that way, or you can kind of dive in to one of the collections and this will lay out, right, uh, all of the documents that are in this collection. You can just, I'm just gonna click on one at random and it'll pull you up and bring you to that document. Uh, and then lastly, right, we are working on this subject tag and this will say, we're working on it uh, we are going to come back to this spot and we're going to be putting in the subject tags that we have and this will lay out uh, kind of the thematic clusters that you can click on and you can engage to uh, explore more or more targeted areas of Kentucky history through CWGK. Uh, that is a broad overview. Again, discovery.civilwargovernors.org. That'll bring you to our CWGK site and you can begin exploring. All right, Chuck, well, thank you so much again for taking time today to talk with a Civil War about Civil War Governors of Kentucky. Uh, again, if you're interested in exploring this site, you can find it at discovery.civilwargovernors.org. You can also find it on the H Civil War page under resources and under digital humanities. Before I let you go, uh, where can people find you on the web and see what you're up to? Yeah, 
Um, but thank you again for having me here. And if you guys are interested in reaching out, you can find me on Twitter at C Walsko, uh, my last name, W E L S K O. If you want to reach out by email, you can reach out at charles.welsko at ky.gov or my own personal website, crwelsko.com. Thank you again, Chase, for having me. It was great to talk to you, and I'm, I hope people get to explore CWGK more and, and learn a little bit more about the site. Certainly. We really appreciate your time today, and thank you so much for everybody for watching.